On the agenda today, balancing the books, members of the Alexandria City Council are currently considering an $880 million budget. So what the heck is in it and what's not in it and why should anybody care? Agenda Alexandria is here to help you understand the proposed fiscal year budget for 2024. Monday, March 27th, we'll be hosting a panel discussion at the Lyceum with Budget Director Morgan Rout, former city councilman and Agenda Alexandria founding member David Speck former city councilman Frank Fannin, and former school board member Ronnie Campbell. And we definitely want to see you at the Lyceum, uh, but while we're waiting, we thought it would be a good idea to dig into the budget a little bit and see what's in it. And we have the best guest here to help us understand what we should be thinking about this document and what questions we should be asking about it. We're joined by an associate professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. He's an Alexandria resident living in Old Town North, Alan Shark, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, glad to be here and glad to be of help. All right, so um, so you're recommending that our listeners uh, take a in order to take a critical eye at the budget, they would need to look at seven different things: surplus or deficit, debt level, credit rating, reserves, economic growth, unfunded pension liabilities, and revenue diversification. So that's a really great frame for our conversation on this podcast. So I want to take all seven of those bullet points one at a time, starting with that first one, surplus or deficit. So the city is planning a deficit of $12.3 million for FY 2025. And then if you look at the out years, it goes up to like $60 million deficit for FY 2028. So, Professor Shark, what do we make of that sort of deficits in the near future and as far as the eye can see? Well, one thing about a budget, when people are, you know, listing deficits, the first thing that comes to mind, and I say this half jokingly, it means they're being honest, you know, as opposed to if everything <laughs> looked perfect, then you'd say, wait a minute, that's too good to be true. We do know that the city has a lot of obligations uh, for sewer mitigation. And those costs are going to rise. So we know that. We know that general expenses are going up. Uh, so when you look at surplus or deficit, you're looking at what are the items that are growing the most? Um, are they growing out of, uh, out of proportion based on prior years? And why? I mean, a budget, and this is, I think, the overriding thing that I look at, is what makes this year different than last and the other thing, there's actually an eighth bullet that I want to add, and that is um, this whole idea of, of, of context. But we'll come back to that. Let's stay with this surplus or deficit that you mentioned. How mm -hmm. does this compare with previous years? And clearly, they're projecting out uh, in terms of you know, what up to 2028, I believe. And so it's telling us a story. This is very important. But that eighth thing comes in, and I want to say that in all of these things, it really has to come at what are the assumptions? What are the underlying circumstances that, that we have to also be looking at? I think in the case of the surplus or deficit being somewhat specific, it is about uh, some required mandates by the federal government and the state government. So we know the expenses are there. And then the other question is, okay, how does the revenue, how can we make the revenue work? And of course, if, uh, if, if, we, if the city could do that, they would do that very easily. But there's obviously been a pushback on uh, real estate taxes and other kind of taxes. So we're living in an environment when people want tons of services and they don't want to pay as much um, uh, for them. So, and, and then we have a down economy at this moment in time. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's like a perfect storm where we really know expenses um, and we're trying to be careful about the revenue lines and being realistic because we know that uh, if a city is not, um, they will face the voters in the next year. Yeah, well, to that point, I think one of the headlines, of course, about the budget is no change to the tax rate. So the tax rate will stay the same. You actually might end up, of course, paying a higher tax bill um, because the value of your property has probably gone up. But um, but headline uh, in terms of our listeners, no change in the tax rate. So we so we talked about deficits here projected in the near future and well into the out years. Let's talk about the next bullet point here, which is debt level. So um, 
Alexandria's debt service is currently $83 million, and that's expected to double over the next decade. So the city takes on debt in six different areas. General fund supported debt service, sanitary sewer debt service, stormwater management debt service, Potomac Yard debt service, which is paid for by the Potomac Yard generated tax and developer revenues. And then finally, landmark debt service. So, Professor Shark, what do we make of the debt level here that the that the city of Alexandria is taking on right now? Well, I think the most important thing to recognize is that local governments, unlike the federal government, have to have a balanced budget, which puts tremendous pressure on any city or any county in this country. Uh, Alexandria is no exception, even though it's one of the, by far, one of the better managed uh, cities in the in the entire country. I'm, I'm so happy to be uh, a citizen here. I'm very proud to uh, to be that. But on the other hand, the reality is that we know that uh, if if there is a uh, moratorium on raising property taxes, which is one of the major sources of revenue, then you have to make it up somewhere. You have to submit a balanced budget. And so in many cases, it makes sense to um, take on debt, to invest in the future uh, by doing things today that will have large paybacks later on. My guess is that at some point when the uh, the debt uh, is satisfied and we can stabilize some of the things that we're doing, I mean, we're still, we're not a, a mature city at this point. We're still going through tremendous growth. And so therefore the question is, uh, how do we invest in that growth now when you have developers willing to invest? You have people willing to come in to these new projects uh, that are, are being built or being proposed. That leads to a, a larger tax base in the long run, people who are going to dine here and spend money. And it's, it's part of economic uh, development. So debt is not a terrible thing. In fact, debt is important. And I don't know of any city or county that doesn't have debt. What is critical to debt is your next bullet, which is credit rating. Well, because... actually, b before we get into credit rating, actually, I, just, sure. I want to stay on debt for just one minute here. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of our listeners would make a distinction between taking on debt for sanitary sewer debt service or stormwater management debt service. And that's kind of, that's one thing, right? But it's something totally different to take on debt for Landmark or Potomac Yard. So talk about that a little bit, because, you know, some of our listeners, and you hear this in Alexandria, you know, there's this fear that the city is being overdeveloped. And here the city is taking on actual debt for redevelopment of Landmark and Potomac Yard. So is that a responsible way to take on debt? My first answer is I don't have all the details, but generally speaking, the answer is it's a value judgment. And to the extent that it makes sense to have, in this case, a Nova in a landmark serve as a major anchor, uh, kind of portends many business opportunities that will you know, last many, many decades. And the Potomac Yard, which had no economic value for the most part, that's gone through you know, a major transformation and now going through another transformation uh, leads to greater economic growth. Now, people may complain about the potential for congestion and traffic and the need for additional services, but the bigger picture is that this does actually help the city. It brings in a high clientele. It brings in more spending. Uh, it brings in more people to the tax base. Uh, it is better use of the properties themselves. I mean, high density property does yield uh, better returns. Um, and the uh, the days of, you know, you could have you know, sprawling lands with, you know, one house here and one house there. Those days are long gone. And that's why we see so many developers looking at underutilized property and seeing, well, here's here's a, a nice office building in the middle. It's surrounded by outdoor parking. If they could take that whole piece of property, put the parking underground, they're going to be able to realize a greater return. The city is a partner in this. People are investing billions. So the amount that the city is proposing by way of debt is relatively small compared to the investments made in the private sector. So it is a good partnership if the vision is to maximize the property for the best use possible. Hmm. And then moving on here to credit rating. So you started talking about this earlier, but Alexandria has a great credit rating. It's triple A. And not only is it triple A, but more than one of these credit rating agencies has declared it as being triple A. As a matter of fact, there are two of them, which makes Alexandria something known as a double triple A uh, credit rating. So, um, but I, I will note for our listeners 
that there are more than two credit rating agencies and our neighbor uh, Arlington has a triple triple A credit rating, which they like to trash talk Alexandria as having only a double triple A credit rating. Professor Shark, does this make any difference? Not between the A's. Um, where it would make a difference if it's below that and double A and it goes down from there. It's a very intricate list. And the difference between Alexander Arlington is, is, is very minuscule and it really is not going to make much of a difference. But when it comes to debt level, um, credit ratings are very, very important generally. And, and, and the reason is that the, uh, the lower the rating, the more you have to pay in interest. And when you look at the amounts that that any city or county is, is is forecasting, that could you know result in millions of dollars. And so, to the extent that a city can show that it is credit worthy in its business operations, and that uh, it uh, has been looked at as being you know well managed, um, that goes a long way for many reasons. One, it should make citizens feel really good about how the budget is being uh, administered. Now. We may have our differences about density. We may have our differences about many sub issues. But when it comes to how the city finances things, you know, then they're doing a fantastic job, which in the end means that the amount in which they are turning to the debt uh, is something that can be best managed by having the best ratings. And we're right up there. Hmm. Okay, so moving on to the next bullet point here, reserves. So I took a look at uh, the part of the budget that talks about contingent reserves, um, which it sets aside about $1.7 million for contingent reserves, which, by the way, is about half of what the city set aside last year because of they, they note changes to climate change initiatives and out of school time were moved to different departments. And then there was funding for a weekend zoning administrator that was moved to the employee compensation section of the budget. So they're kind of moving parts and pieces around here. I, I will note that the largest contingency item here is for undesignated city council programming, which is interesting because at the end of the budget cycle, the city council members love to put their Christmas tree ornaments on, <laughs> on this thing. And so yeah. uh, they've got $500 million set aside for whatever the city council wants to add to the budget process, which clearly they're going to add stuff. Um, also, four hundred ninety million for Alexandria and Nova Hospital, which um, is going to change the numbers based on expanded Medicaid eligibility. There's four hundred thousand dollars in here for early childhood services, three hundred thousand in here for a pay incentive for city employees to use their language skills on a regular basis. Um, so, what do we make of the contingent reserves here in the city budget? Well, reserves really is like. Anyone would, um, you know, look at their own financial situation. I mean, there are people who live on the edge from paycheck to paycheck, and I feel for them. In an ideal world, what we should be doing is set aside money for a rainy day. And reserves are all about having money for the unforeseen expense. It could be a, a snowmageddon, although with global warming, I guess I don't see that. Um, but what if all, all of a sudden trees started to die all over the place because they couldn't keep up with the climate? These are unexpected events that occur. And so any city um, that is well managed always tries to maintain reserves. You don't want to spend every penny. You want to be able to put something aside for the just in case, something um, that uh, didn't make its way to the budget, but suddenly needs to be taken care of. And these things, these things happen all the time. And so it's always a challenge when you have so many needs and so many requirements for spending uh, to put money aside. It is a discipline. I do that personally. Um, but uh, I think in terms of looking at a budget, at least there is a figure. Uh, someone could ask, um, why isn't it more? Although I think you've given part of that answer. Um, and, and what do they hope to have? What is the, the, the proper balance? That's, that's really a, a subjective kind of thing, but it's not a bad question to ask. Well, the next question we're going to ask is about economic growth, um, which, so the, if you look at the proposed budget, uh, there's an expectation of growth in several parts of the revenue stream here, that they're expecting growth for jobs in Alexandria, so citywide private jobs. Then there's also expected growth for business receipts, transient, transient lodging tax, gross sales receipts, gross meals tax receipts. Um, which, you know, clearly people are expecting Alexandria to continue to grow. Um, is this the kind of growth that's expected? Is it too much? Is it too little? What do we make of the economic growth here? 
Well, I can't answer the specifics. I mean, that's what the city officials are going to have to do. But I can tell you, as a citizen and one who's looked at the budget, um, I'm not sure that's unrealistic. I, I, I look at all the growth that's coming uh, coming about, the new hotel hotels that are opening, the occupancy rate of, of hotels. Um, there isn't the weekend. I don't see tourists and more and more of them coming to this area. This is one of the hottest areas in the in the country. It's, it's right in the top five uh, for destination vacations. We have people going to National Harbor, but coming over here on the ferry taxi. So. Um, if we have more and more tourists, and this seems to be a hallmark for that, there's every reason to believe that uh, that many of these projections will probably come true. I'd love to see them exceeded. And what does that mean? It means exactly what those budget lines are predicting. And they are only predictions. Um, and that is that um, more people will go out to the restaurants. There are many restaurants and they are becoming more and more full. Um, and, and there are people who are purchasing things uh, in many of our retail stores. So it's a very vibrant community that seems to attract a lot of people outside of the vibrant community that lives here all year round, like myself. So I can't, I'm not an economic expert in terms of the particulars that went into the budget, but overall, it seems that it's reasonable to assume that we will continue to grow because this destination continues to be attractive and that seems to be increasing. And then the next thing we want to take a look at is unfunded pension liabilities, which is kind of one of those lurking monsters that lurks in the shadows for governments all across the country, really. States have unfunded pension liability. Local governments have unfunded pension liability. Is this kind of, a, you know, the, the disaster that has yet to strike or what should people think about the threat here of unfunded pension liabilities? Well, to my knowledge, um, the pension has been well-funded. Um, there are two pieces to this, however. I mean, one is, well, actually, there are three. One is, are there unfunded pension liabilities? I'm not aware. I mean, if there is, then the city needs to talk about that. They, but the other part of it is, you know, making sure that the investments, given the uncertainty of the market, uh, keeps pace with the uh, pension liability. You know, this is where risk managers have to be very, very careful and make sure that their invest investments are well diversified, that they are being very, very prudent. At the same time, you know, they've got to generate income. Um, this is the key to pension. But there's a third piece that's not really talked about, and that is what will be the implications of collective bargaining agreements? Mm -hmm. To what extent will agreements cause pensions perhaps to rise? And then, you know, how quickly can the city adjust to that? Because usually when there's collective bargaining, one thing that is certain, that means that uh, wages and fringe benefits usually go up. And so there may be contract uh, obligations that will increase over the years. The key is to have our eyes open, be aware of what these things are and make sure they are in the budget. And the citizens are aware of it well in advance of when a budget comes out to make sure um, that this is within their, their comfort level. Mm -hmm. And then the final piece here that we wanted to look at was revenue diversification. So Alexandria has had a, I guess, a problem in recent years, or I guess it's been viewed as a problem that so much of the revenue is really tied up here in property taxes. So residential real estate property, that's 37% of the city's revenue. Commercial property is 24% of the city's revenue. Personal property is like 8%. So when you add up the residential property taxes, commercial property taxes, personal property taxes, that's the vast majority of your budget. So that's not really diversified, right? So uh, is that a problem for Alexandria? Well, first of all, I would say it is somewhat diversified. And the problem is that local governments have only so many ways in which to accept or, or get revenue. I mean, when you think about it, um, if you were sitting, you know, as, if you were running a city, you have to look at where your income is going to come from. And traditionally, it is coming from taxes. And those are your three major pools. When you look at other forms of taxes, well, you know, you do have your sales receipts and actual consumer um, based kind of consumption. And then you have the possibility, which is so helpful, is grants. And living in this area, you know, many politicians are very well aware. Some actually live here. I'm talking about state and federal uh, employees and politicians. And so they do have an economic interest to see that uh, the cities like this and our neighboring um, cities and counties do well. So to the extent that we can get uh, grants and contracts, 
which we've been very successful over the years, that is a real positive. But, you know, there is no magic here. There is just so many ways we can get and derive income. And so when you look at that and say, okay, nobody wants their property taxes to rise, then something has to give. Something has to be let go. Does that mean that we, you know, uh, have less fire protection, less police protection, less schools? Um, the decisions are, are very, very difficult. Um, and so I, I have sympathy for any civic leader on the municipal side because the choices are, are fairly difficult and you're dealing with an uncertain economy. You're dealing with an uncertain political environment. Um, there's talk of recession, all of which could have an enormous impact uh, on the budget moving forward. So revenue diversification is always a goal. Everyone wants to do that. We acknowledge that. Um, that's the same thing in business. Um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that you can just walk out and say, oh, yeah, we have to invent a new category and then we'll, everything will be fine. There are limits to what a city or county can do to diversify. Well, one more question on revenue diversification. So we went through the major sources of revenue, which are property taxes. That's the vast majority of the revenue. Um, but I want to walk through the other pizza slices here, the smaller slices in our pie chart, which is federal government, money from the federal government, money from the state government, um, communication sales tax, restaurant food tax, transient lodging, recordation tax, business license tax, utility tax, and sales tax. So, I mean, it, there is diversification in the sense that there are many slices to that pie, but it does seem kind of disproportionate, right? Well, but historically, I, I go back to context. Um, for localities such as Alexandria, it has always been uh, the property taxes that have always been the largest uh, income producer. It's just a fact of life in terms of how governments were formed. Uh, everything was predicated on property. And that is an historical fact. Everything was always predicated. And then the other taxes were added to kind of make up for uh, the deficiencies. And so, yeah, there is a diversification by category, but it is very, very traditional uh, to have the lion's share coming from property taxes. I don't know of any other uh, major form of income that could could compete with those revenue lines. So that uh, is a challenge. Now, can the other areas grow? Yes. Can they grow through use or do they have to grow through increasing the rates? That is up to the city, but those are decisions, but it's not going to yield the same amount as the property taxes. So we're kind of hooked on that. All local governments are. Can other taxes be increased? Probably. Um, will it yield the dramatic results that some may want, uh, probably not. But all things are should be on the table at all times. All right. Well, you're really helping us understand the budget in terms of previewing our March 27th event at the Lyceum. So we definitely want to see you uh, March 27th at the Lyceum. Start at 7 o'clock. We're going to have the budget director for the city, Morgan Rout, uh, plus the former city councilman, David Speck, former city councilman, Frank Fannin, former school board member, Ronnie Campbell. So we definitely want to see you there. Um, but you, Professor Shark, you helped us understand this budget. So we really thank you for doing that. Associate Pro Professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, Alan Shark. Thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Hope this helps. Thank you.
Hello, good evening everybody. How are you tonight? I'm glad the weather held off so that it wasn't rainy when you arrived. Welcome to the March program of Agenda Alexandria. It's entitled Crafting a Budget, the Art, Science, and Politics of Making Choices. My name is Rod Cookrow and I'm, I'm, I've got the privilege this year of being the chairman of Agenda Alexandria um, after a long string of much more qualified people than me. Uh, but I'm going to try to do my best tonight to moderate the, the panel and keep the, argu the argument or the, or the information going. There may be an argument. I don't think there will be. Um, anyway, thanks very much for being here. Um, if you're a member of Agenda Alexandria, thank you twice for being here because we do ask for donations because our cost involves having a place like this to meet and a place like the Masonic Memorial to meet. If we were just a virtual, um, a, a virtual uh, event sponsor, we wouldn't need this. But we do need, we do need um, contributions if you're inclined or available to do that. Um, I want our board members, some are here tonight. If our, if our board members can stand up, Henry, I know you're here. Who else is here? Board members. Well, you still get applause. Yeah. Yes, all right, yes, all right. And of course, and, and, and the most indispensable person our organization is Pat Miller. I think Pat is still downstairs welcoming people, but if Pat were here, we, we have, a, uh, we have, a, we have a, uh, several what I would call platinum sponsors. They include the Zebra, which as you all know is the, our, our local most successful newspaper, uh, McInerney Associates, and Simpson Development. But there are also a lot of new and renewing members uh, that we value a lot, people like Gant Redman, Eleanor Quigley, Ellie Reagan, Charles Grace, Richard Miller, Charles Wilson, and some new sustaining members who contribute, thank you, $250 a year. David Baker, Marianne Bernstein, Helen Clark, Oscar Fitzgerald, Hector Mares, Marion Moon, Arthur Peabody, John Romanen, and David Speck, who is an original founder of this organization. So please silence your cell phones. If you have to take a call, you can go outside in the vestibule. That'd be great. Um, and please be respectful of our panelists. I haven't had to say that much, but we've had some, some more controversial topics in, in the past year or two where people have expressed their opinion from the audience uh, that they probably should have kept themselves. Uh, if, you have, if you have something you want to say to a panelist or you want to say to me, you know, put it in an email. Um, lastly, I want to recognize tonight some people in the audience who I think Alexander, I appreciate being here. First and foremost, John Chapman, the council member. It's good to see you here, John, and a former council member and the former vice mayor of Alexandria with his former, I guess you would call second lady, uh, Bill and Ruth Cleveland. Thank you very much. Anyway, today's program is going to focus on this, the budget process, not the budget that's proposed by the city's manager right now that's under discussion. That's going to take several months to sort of unwind what that's about, but it's a good touchstone for what we're looking at today. So the city manager, Jim Parajon, is his first year proposed a budget of $881 million for fiscal year 2024. Um, the context is valuable here as 15 years ago, I'll use that as a touchstone year, in 2007, the budget was $493 million. So we've gone up almost $400 million in 15 years. Um, this proposed budget has no increase in the property tax rate of $1.11, which is the one metric most people look at when they see the story on the budget in the newspaper. Nevertheless, tax bills are gonna increase because the rate's not going down so far because we have higher property assessments because Alexandria is, as David will tell you and others will, it's a place people want to live, so the price of housing keeps going up and up. So today's rate, nevertheless, is 36% higher than it was in 2007 when it was 81.5 cents. Now at that time, then Mayor Bill Ewell didn't like the feedback he was getting from citizens and he proposed cutting the tax rate by 10 cents 
to sort of soften that blow to taxpayers. And he did that successfully. He got a majority of council, I think, I think actually everybody in council supported him, was to cut that rate by 10 cents so that people were still paying a little more, but not a lot more. So the budget process is a complex one. People who read what they read in the paper when it first comes out may simplify it and say, oh my God, my taxes are going up and this is terrible. But it's very complex. It's, a, it's really not a several month long process. It's, it's a year long process. It starts with the city staff. It involves elected officials. It involves at the city council and the school board, by the way. And then it involves the input or the, or the demands of special interest groups like unions and, and, and developers and civic groups, as well as individual citizens who know some of these former elected officials over the back fence or from their church or temple relationships. And they talk to them about the budget. So at the end of the process, there is this thing called the ad delete session, which a lot of people look at almost for entertainment. I hate to say that, but it's the time when the members of council, like John this year, will be able to say, I've got this one thing I really, really think we ought to be doing more of. And people ask support from his council colleagues to do that thing. And under a rule that I understand was established back when Kerry Donnelly and Michael Jackson were on council, he's got to propose to cut the budget somewhere to accomplish what he wants to do. That's an interesting process, and it's worth watching this year when it occurs sometime in mid or late May. But it's important also to realize that the city of Alexandria operates under a lot of constraints that other cities and counties in the country do not operate under. Um, we've got a city charter granted by the, assembly, the Virginia General Assembly. And they, they tell us what we can and cannot do. And then there are the overriding laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia that, that affect everybody. And then there's this thing, this poison pill in the minds of some officials, maybe Morgan, you can speak to that, called the Dillon Rule. There was a 19th century legislator, his name was Dillon. And he, uh, he popularized a con construct in government where localities can only do what the state tells you they can do. So unlike our, call, our here's a good example, a recent example. Alexandria now has a five cent tax on a, on a plastic grocery bag. If you go to Safeway, you gotta say how many bags do I have and you gotta put down how many bags you have and they, they give you a 15 cents extra bill. In Montgomery County, Maryland, or PG County, Maryland, they can just say, we're gonna do that. But Alexandria had to go to Richmond to say, can we, all, can we impose a five cent tax on a plastic bag? That's because of the Dillon rule. And it is a real constraint on Alexandria's ability to govern the way the majority of its current residents may want to. And this is important because a lot of people, maybe not in this room, but maybe people watching, they're not recent or lifelong residents of Alexandria. They've come to somebody else. They've come to some other place like Massachusetts or Illinois or Florida or Texas where local governments can do what they want to do. That can't happen here without Richmond saying you may do it. And that's a real, that's a real hang up for Alexandria's ability to govern the way it wants to or the way it thinks its citizens want to. So those are the things we're gonna to explore tonight. We have four great panelists, I'll introduce them. From my far right, Morgan Rout, did I say that right? Yes, sir. He's the budget director for Alexander. He's been the budget director for almost eight years now. He's been in the city for I think 30 years. Um, he knows the budget inside out. We're so happy you came, Morgan. I Thank know you. you're, you're, you. you're in your peak season, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, Next to him is Frank Fannin. Frank Fannin is a, is a fourth or fifth generation Alexander. I don't know, did, did you come over the Mayflower or whatever? Uh, you were here a long time. When, when the Irish guys got here, 1845. Okay, 1845. <laughs> uh, Frank, Frank has been um, acting in the Chamber of Commerce. He, he's a, he's a well-known local banker. He was at one point the chairman uh, preceding me of a gen Alexandria, but more importantly, he was the last elected Republican to the Alexandria City Council. <laughs> Uh, next to Frank is Ronnie Campbell. Ronnie Campbell uh, has the distinction of being the longest ever serving, so far, school board member under the elected model. That was a controversial thing long, many years ago to elect or not elect a school board. Ronnie, when it, after it happened, she ran. Ronnie served under probably three superintendents, several city managers, and you have perspective that is important to tonight's discussion. Four mayors, okay. 
Uh, and last but certainly not least, um, directly next to me is David Speck. David uh, has been a longtime public servant in the city, uh, both in the, in the elected realm and the nonprofit realm. Uh, certainly, he was, in, he was instructive in helping to get this organization started when there had to be a safe, I think he told me, a safe place for public discussion on issues like this without people becoming heated or angry or, you know, or, or nonsensical with each other. And Agenda Alexander was that place. We hope it still is. So David um, has served the city council. He, he was, um, I have to say this, a very, very close friend and confidant of uh, our recently deceased Mayor Kerry Donnelly. Uh, and I, I know that you and him uh, worked a lot together to try to craft a way of governing in Alexander that, that, was, that was respectful and civil. And I thank you for that. <laughs> so let's get, let's get started. Um, hey, Virginia, nice to see you here. Uh, I want you to East tell us briefly, because after, after like a three or four minute introduction, I want to go to the questions. But briefly, tell us sort of who you are, obviously, why you're here, but more importantly, to give some color to your experience, if you could think of an anecdote that would tell us how difficult it is to work with the budget process, or did you have a surprise at one point when you were, when we were in the process where you thought, oh my God, this is not that hard, or it's really hard. So, and, so tell us who you are and, and why you're here, and then something that made you sort of remember why you took part in this process. And Morgan, right now you're in it, I'll let you go first. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for the invitation to attend. Um, so my name is Morgan Rout. I am the budget director for the city of Alexandria. Um, I have uh, worked for the city for about 23 years. I've uh, been the budget director for about eight years, um, as he said. Um, and I'm really here, well, I'm here by invitation, but I was excited to get the opportunity to speak to you because um, I understand that you all want to have a better understanding of the budget process and try to get some questions answered. So I was hopeful that I would be able to contribute to that. Um, but then it's also an opportunity for me to hear from you all in the community about where we're, we're continuously trying to improve the budget process every year. Um, and as much input as we can get into that is, is extremely helpful. So uh, those are the two reasons why I wanted to be here tonight, help you all understand the process a bit better, but then also learn from you all as well. Um, as far as an anecdote is concerned, I think my anecdote is that I couldn't come up with an anecdote. Um, and, and that is a reflection because you said uh, something that reflects on how complicated the budget is. And we are uh, very much in the middle of it right now. We are trying to support city council. Uh, the city manager has proposed his budget. We are trying to support council in the hard, uh, the difficult decisions that they need to make. Um, and so we're trying to answer all the questions that we can and we're holding work sessions with them. Uh, so. Uh, we're generally walking around with about uh, with about a thousand things in our head right now, and uh, and it's it's sort of uh, that like, like that every day. So um, so yeah, by anecdote, is that I can't even come up with an anecdote other than that right for for the moment. Yeah, well, so so Morgan, I appreciate you're not having a direct answer, but still, it seems like as time goes on, more and more things are coming at you about the budget. We have to make quick decisions, or you got to refer them to people and staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that like swimming during a a hurricane or a, I mean, or a tidal wave? I mean, do you feel overwhelmed at the pace at which you have to answer questions for the manager himself or for members of council or the mayor? I wouldn't say it's overwhelming. Um, it's certainly a challenge. Uh, there's you know, a, t a ton of information uh, out there. There's, uh, there's a lot of questions to be answered, but um, it, I wouldn't say it's overwhelming, but it, we want to be very careful and deliberate about the answers we're providing and how careful we think through them. And so, uh, so, uh, you know, it is, it takes a substantial effort. And yes, I have a, I have a great team that works for me. Um, all of the departments of the city are very helpful in providing information and, um, you know, answering questions as well. So we have them to all rely on, but it's kind of more like, uh, I think trying to, um, not so much swimming in a, in a storm or anything like that, but trying to manage a complex process with a lot of trains running on a lot of different tracks all at the same time and trying to make sure it all gets done with quality. If agenda, if agenda, not agenda, if Alexandria residents send you a message through Alex 311, the city's preferred method of contacting departments with a budget question, how quick can you get back to them? 
so we don't actually get a whole lot of questions directly from the public through 311, but we try to respond to those as quickly as possible. What we mostly get through 311 is comments. Um, we have uh, multiple opportunities for the community to provide input in the budget process, um, public hearings um, uh, being one of them, but we frequently get comments uh, on the website through 311 and we try to, we post those online so everybody else gets the opportunity to see them and also most particularly so that city council gets to see them and is aware of what we're hearing from the community. Okay, thanks, Morgan. Um, I'll remind our audience, stream it online. You can ask questions online. Also, if you make, want to make a comment through Twitter, if you're on Twitter, you just use the hashtag Agenda Alexandria, and you can make comments or ask questions, and they'll show up on this screen back here, and Michael E. Pope will relay them to me. Um, so Frank, Frank Fannin, welcome, thanks for coming. Um, Thank remember you. the question, like, uh, why sure. are you here, who yeah, are yeah, you, yeah, and, yeah, sure. okay. and describe so, something yeah. interesting that well, sort of you remember from the budget process. Sure, well, one of the things when I was elected to the city council in 2009, you know, we're kind of, I guess we're saying we're in budget season right now, but really the budget is a whole year long process. I remember uh, in October, the city manager usually comes to all the council members and says, are there any specific needs or wants or requests you want in the budget? And they start developing it in October. And it goes through November, December, and then in February, the city manager rolls out his proposed budget. And then you really get this time from February to May where the city council is debating what their needs are and what their wants are and you know where we're gonna be able to, to set the tax rate. And, um, you know, it's really, I, I worked with Morgan and he was fabulous and so was Bruce Johnson and Kendall who are here tonight. So I, I think we really have a very professional budget team and a budget staff here in Alexandria. But, you know, it really comes down to the city council. They're the electeds and, you know, four city council members, the, the vote passes. So um, what, are, what are the needs and the wants that really is, is up to the city council? And you know the biggest challenge that I see going on right now in the city is I've been in mortgage banking for 30 years, same job, Crestar, SunTrust, Truist. Haven't switched jobs, but the banks changed three times. But I remember uh, financing houses in Rosemont in 1993 that were 150,000, and now they're 750,000. It's great for the homeowner; they have a lot of equity in the house, but you can't spend your equity usually every day. And right now. You know, the average assessed single family home in the cities, uh, I believe it's over $900,000, which is equivalent to a $10,000 a year tax bill. So that's just a huge challenge asking, you know, homeowners to pay over $800 a month in taxes. So that's one of the big challenges that I see the city councils dealing with right now. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Ronnie, your perspective is a little different because when you were on school board, you really went through almost two budget processes. One was when you took the superintendent of the school's budget and massaged it and commented on it and did the whole trade-off thing as the council does with their budget, then you had to meet the council. Right. And they may have said to you, what are you telling us you need from the budget? Because they have other priorities. Or maybe, or maybe sometimes, because David who had an education background, maybe he said to you, well, I'll support that and I'll buy into it. But, but what was it, what, what was, what's, what's the challenge for a school board member dealing with the budget because of course your constituency of people in the city with children in public schools is very small and it's shrinking as development happens we have more and more one bedroom and two bedroom properties that don't support families so that that constituency has a lot of demands and a lot of needs obviously but but it's it's less it's less so the burden for the schools which is about correct me if i'm wrong it's about one third of the city budget roughly 36 to 38 percent. still that, John? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's the demand on the school system of, of, from taxpayers. How do you sort of be a cheerleader for why that's the it's, right thing to do? It's, it is actually very difficult because um, you have all of our own needs just for the schools. Our priority as school board members is to advocate for the schools. That's our job. We hire and fire the superintendent, we make policies, and we work the budget and we try to get what we need we have to we go through ad deletes as well we go through it multiple times sometimes because we have to do it ourselves when the superintendent proposes his budget to us once we've accepted that which takes a lot of time because there's often things that we have to deal with that we either don't really feel we need that maybe they want 
and there may be other priorities that some of the board members that want, and so we have to work together as a team and try to come up with something that everybody can pretty much agree with. Then it becomes our budget. We propose the school board's budget to the city council, and then often we have to go back again to the drawing board. We hear a lot about we always support, fully support the schools, but there's a lot of work before that happens. So a lot of times we have certain amounts that are cut, we have to go back to the drawing board, figure out what are we going to take out to make it work. And during that process, one of the things that we have to do, because we need to get support, if they're just listening to nine people, it might not be as effective. So one of the things that the school board does is we go out to our PTAs, to all the organizations that are telling us what they want and what they need for their schools. Maybe their schools mold all in it and they need to have that fixed immediately for health reasons. Okay, then we need to make that a priority and put that in the budget. We have to all agree to that. Then we have to take it back to the city council again and say, okay, these are the things we absolutely need. We, you know, there's, these are our priorities. And then we work with them. Sometimes we have to go back again before we get it straight, before we can agree. And then, but it's, it's a long process. It's more than a couple times that we're going through ad deletes. Was there ever any kind of surprising episode in your, in your time in doing the budget where you thought like, oh my God, I never thought we'd get that, or I can't believe they're not letting us have that thing? I do remember a time, I think it was when we were start, we were very beginning of um, electronics for the schools, and we knew it was gonna be a priority. Other, other area districts were doing it, and we knew our children needed to have this education because if they're gonna work in the real world, they're gonna have to have it. And when we brought it to the council, that was the exact amount that was cut. Okay, now you can't do that. That's called line item cutting. That's, that's not legal. The council is not allowed to cut a line item from the budget. So we had to go back and talk about it. And so what we did, we said, okay, we know this is a priority. We know we have to have this. So we cut some other things. They weren't really happy about that because then they started hearing from the public. What? Because you didn't give them enough money, then this was cut and this was cut. So it ended up working out. We got what we needed. The kids now are very savvy when it comes to computers, the majority of them. And our teachers have learned also. That was another issue, getting the teachers on board so that they could teach the children. A lot of them retired because they just, it was too much. But um, we have a lot of very strong, excellent teachers in the school system now, and they're working with the kids, and the kids are, are ready for that, that workforce. And we're being told what kind of jobs that are needed right now, and we're trying to, you know, engineers, we need engineers, we need female engineers. These are the kind of things, so we're looking for those. I have tablets now, they're, they're doing that yes, work. Exactly. Um, David, um, your experience spans several councils, both as a Republican and a Democrat. Um, You've always been thought of by many, many people, including myself, as one of the smartest and most thoughtful people on the council over time because, as you said, I remember reading a story in the journal when you, when you and Michael Jackson stepped down the, for, after your first term. You said, people didn't like me because I always liked to argue both sides. I just liked the, the, the debate of issues. Um, I, I, ha I still have the clip. I know what you said. You, you liked that discussion. So... In your experience on council, when you were trying to deal with the budget, sometimes you were involved in your first term in particular with, uh, with the second term, with Lonnie Rich, right? Uh, where you would say, why, not, why do we do it this way? Why can't we do it another way? I mean, what, what's your anecdote about when you were on council and you tried maybe to affect some change that either succeeded or did not? I know, you, I know one thing I know, I, I remember you taking not just credit for it, but, but you, you were important about, there was, a, there was a police officer residential program, right? right? right. Maybe talk about how, how, how did that come to be? How did you convince people that was an important thing to do? Um, Thank I'll, you for being here. By the way, you're welcome. Thank you. I, I'll get to that, uh, but let me just give you sort of the opening. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, my family goes back in Alexandria to 1850. So according to Frank, I'm like one of the newcomers. Um, but, um, and I've, I've lived here, uh, I'll dispel one myth. Um, I was not born here. I was born in New York City and moved here when I was six weeks old. My father, who was a physician here, 
was finishing his residency in um, New York at uh, Bellevue, and right after he finished, we moved here and he started practicing. Um, and so I've been here all my life, almost 78 years now, and seeing a lot of things as all of us have, even if you haven't been here that long, um, a lot of changes, some good, maybe some not so good. But when you listen to us uh, responding to questions and commenting, we all come with some sort of different perspectives and frame, frames of reference about things that we're concerned about or seeing. Um, when I uh, used to talk about the budget, and still do occasionally, um, the one thing that I always said is my frame of reference is that the budget um, is a big version of what we often deal with in our own individual lives. Managing debt, making sure your revenue comes in to pay your bills, um, how you address that if you see shortfalls, how you manage your debt um, when uh, values are changing. And so as, as I answer some of the questions or comment, uh, that's the frame of reference that I often look at because I think it's, this is just a bigger version of what we often address in our lives. So um, I grew up just on the east side of Quaker Lane, and if I walked across the street, I was in Fairfax County. Everything that you know to be the west end of Alexandria was Fairfax County, and Alexandria annexed it in 1952. You can't do that anymore, but that was typically how um, small towns and cities expanded their tax base into the rural, rural counties surrounding them. Al Virginia is unique, um, with a, a couple minor exceptions. We are the only state that has independent cities and independent counties. All that area south of the city that has an Alexander mailing address, and when you ask people where they live and they say Alexandria, and, and I ask them where specifically, and I say, no, that's Fairfax County. But they like mailing addresses of Alexandria, so my answer always was, we're gonna start paying taxes here. But um, uh, that, that's uh, one of the issues that we confront as a, as a small community. And um, if you look at the map of Alexandria and come back 50 years from now, it's the same map, it's the same constraints, it's the same limitations. So I'll give you one analogy and then we'll get into questions. Um, imagine for a moment that you have a business making a product, delivering a service, it's quality, you manage your costs, you manage your expenses, your pricing for your product or your service, um, and you're doing a good job because people like what you do and they feel that the price is reflective of the quality of the service or the product. Everything's fine. Oh, one little exception. Somebody draws a circle around your business and says, you can do anything you want within that circle, but you can't go beyond it. Now, what do you think will happen over time if you're limited as to how you can build your business you know, scale up your business in different ways. You're gonna to have to start looking at your costs and maybe cut back on some of the costs of your service or the cost of your materials for your product. You're gonna to have to nudge your price up a little bit because um, you limit your customers. Um, you will find that over time, you're gonna start pricing yourself to a point where it may become um, prohibitive the quality of your work may start to decline a little bit because you can't grow. Well, that's Alexandria. You know, just like you used to say, you can't road build your way out of congestion. You can't home build your way out of limitations on your revenue. And this is, if, you, if anybody asked me, what's the one thing that I always worry about the most? It's sources of revenue. Uh, when the one that we can control, the most significant revenue that we have, is real estate taxes. And as that gets bigger and bigger, uh, and becomes arguably in some cases just punitive, and maybe to some people it already is, it's where do you go to get more revenue? 
to pay for the schools, to pay for the services, to expand. Um, even though there's an issue about debt right now, Alexandria is well known in Northern Virginia for managing its debt quite effectively, which allowed it to weather through some of the difficult economic conditions that took place a few years ago in the early 90s in, in particular. Um, so that's my perspective and uh, thank you for allowing me to come and share that and I'm looking forward to some dialogue. Well, thank you, David. What you just said gave me an idea for a first question, although I had another first question. You mentioned the city's constraints it's had over time, given its 16 square miles of what it can do under the city charter. Well, the city charter was first, the last one was granted in 1950, I believe. My math could be off on that, 1950. It was amended several times in the 60s, 70s, and the last time was in 82, mm -hmm. where the city went to Richmond and said, essentially, we've looked at our governing structure and we need to do something different to be able to meet our needs. Oh, somebody's phone. Uh, <laughs> I think somebody's getting a tweet. There's a bird loose in the Lyceum. Uh, and, and so the city amended its charter. And that was now, of course, older than some people in this room have been alive, longer than that. I mean, is it time for the city to consider going back to Richmond, maybe after having a citizen task force? I they don't do much anymore from things and just say, should we change the chart? Ask, ask for charter changes. But we all agree that there has to be a different way to raise revenue, for example, um, and to do the business we need to do so that we don't become a city of only the wealthy and the poor. I mean, I'm gonna go back to you to start because you kind of raised that issue and um, you were alive here and around here and so was your family when the charter was amended all those times. Do you remember anything about that, what it was about? Well, some of it was housekeeping, yeah. um, you know, as communities often do. Um, and uh, by the way, I, I also served in the House of Delegates 40 years ago, and I uh, could defend the Dillon Rule when I was in the House of Delegates. And then when I went on council, that was the dumbest idea that you know, anyone could ever <laughs> propose. So, um, you know, it was, you know, people have very different perspectives about what that does. And, to, you know, if somebody's arguing it, it's, it's to ensure that there is some um, balance that communities have and that you don't get rogue cities going off and doing crazy stuff. Um, I think it's eased a little bit, but it's still difficult. Uh, well, let me ask Morgan the same question. Because Morgan, you're the budget director now, and I guess every year when you come down and kind of crunch the numbers based on last year's budget, you see your limitations on raising revenue. And this year, because of the devaluation in, the, in commercial property, even more and more of the burdens picked up by residential, single-family homeowners and condominium owners. I mean, has there been discussion at the city level of thinking about asking, even though it might be a, a task that's difficult to accomplish, of changing the charter so that we can raise revenue some other ways? Uh, so we have a legislative agenda that we adopt every year. Um, and I think localities, uh, many localities, not all in Virginia, would love to be able to have more flexibility on the re revenue side. That is something we've been lobbying for for as long as I've, I've been in this career. Um, I, and I expect we will continue to. Uh, we haven't had the success uh, that we would like to as far as being able to diversify our tax base um, as far as Richmond is concerned. Um, so I, as far as going back and rewriting the code, I don't know that, or, or the charter, I don't know if we've had those discussions, but we develop a legislative agenda every year and uh, there's uh, you know, multiple jurisdictions lobbying the General Assembly. Uh, you know, one of the points that we're making with them every year is that, that you know we weigh in on the on the bills that are before the General Assembly, and and we you know uh, oppose generally anything that's going to limit our flexibility in terms of being able to dev to to um, diverse, diversify our revenue. So the the burden is not so much on real estate tax, and in particular residential real estate tax. So, so, Frank, I know you have opinions on this issue that are fairly uh, well thought out and strong. Um, when you, and you served one term on council, and you were quite an outspoken voice for what I would call just the average Joe taxpayer, right? Uh, and we've talked about the fact that, you know, if it's not the city's money, it's their money. And, you know, but are there other ways you can look at either needing, if you have to raise more revenue, what would you think about doing that? But if not, does the city need tools 
under the city charter to maybe do fewer things than right now it's obligated to do? One of the big things, uh, people cost money, okay? So, I mean, the United States population has grown 33% since 1990. And I think our population here in Alexandria has increased tremendously. So, you know, this goes into zoning and this new topic on housing and putting more people and more housing in the city and also upzoning apartments. And uh, I mean, the more people that come here, the more it's gonna cost to the taxpayers. So, I mean, if someone moves into an apartment with three children, that's $60,000 for education in public schools. It's about $19,000 a year to educate a child here in the public schools. We need more police officers. We need more firefighters. Um, I mean, New York's, our budget's, uh, you know, the 880 million, New York City budget's 102 billion. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of people up there. So, I mean, the more people and the more dense the city goes, the argument used to be that, you know, if we build uh, more density, it's gonna help the taxes. Well, the effect is it's working totally the opposite. Um, people, you know, and so, so a lot of this comes into, a lot, it's a desirable place to live, but if we keep increasing the zoning, more people are going to come, it's just going to continue to cost more money. Say, say, Ronnie, one of the issues that was um, alive and may still be alive in, in, the, in the minds of voters and sort of policy wonks, when the city moved to elect the school boards in the 90s, uh, because that drive was, was driven by a Democrat, Lonnie Rich, and a Republican, Bill Cleveland who said we ought to elect school boards because every other state does it. But people here, like David Speck said, well, that may be okay, but they can't just be elected unless they have the ability to tax people. If people are here from other states where you had elected school boards, most of those times, the school board could place a levy on the ballot to say we're gonna raise the tax rate by you know, 0.5 cents to build a school or to you know, redo a ball field or whatever. Um, you served on the school board in this overly, con not, I would always, not always contentious time, but a time with a lot of conflict about how your money could be spent based on your needs. But you couldn't say to the council, well, you know, we're gonna just, we, we can't raise our own money, so we have, we have to rely upon you to raise it for us. Was, is that something that if you were to rewrite the city charter should be maybe considered as something that could occur? Because I think in Arlington, for example, I mean, they have bond issues. Um, so we have Fairfax discussed County. bonds in the past, but ultimately it still lies under the city council. We still have to go to the city council. They have to approve our budget, no matter what we're asking for. Our, our job is primarily we have to ask for what we honestly need, what we absolutely need. If we need a new school, something like that, that we absolutely, we have to have it. We have 2,000 kids within three blocks on the West End or we had, that's ridiculous. That's no longer a neighborhood school when you have that many children in it. So we advocated for another school. We needed another building. We were able to get that through with the, the superintendent, definitely agreed once he had, the, we had a new superintendent at the time. Once he understood all the facts and knew the history, he supported it. Once he supported it, the entire board supported it. And then when we went before the council, they had, when, when it's in black and white, and it's facts, you have this many children. You have to support the children. They're, they're here. They're not going anywhere. Now, when you stop housing and you didn't have enough housing, yeah, you, you're shutting down housing, people were leaving. And they were going to Fairfax, they are going to Annandale, Arlington. But once now, now that we needed to have housing for the people that actually work in the city, I think that's what it came down to, for a long time, City Council did not have affordable housing or didn't have much. It, it, was, it became a priority, which was a good thing, in my opinion, because you have to be able to support the people that work here, too, or the businesses are going to close down because they won't have anybody to work. If they have to, trans, if they have to commute from Manassas and Woodbridge, the cost of gas, and these are people that are working two and three jobs sometimes to support their families, they're going to get jobs out there. Let's say the idea of maybe changing the city charter, if you, were, if you were to be able to have a perfect world after no changes in 1982, I'll ask David first and then Morgan. I know you were an advocate for, if you're going to have like the school boards, allow the school board or the school system to actually levy some kind of way to raise money. And then Morgan, I'll ask you, has that ever come up in your conversations over the years you've been budget director with the city manager, present or past, to say, hey, you know, it'd be better for us 
take a lot more pressure off of John Chapman if it was a school board member saying, we got to raise our taxes as opposed to the city manager. So let's start with David first. Well, the first thing that I would note is that there are no big bang solutions to some of the pressure on revenue. Um, so here's a quiz. How many of you would start off on January 1st sort of looking at your expenses and your sources of revenue and realizing there may be um, a little shortfall and you know that? And how, would, how many of you would resolve that by buying lottery tickets? Okay. Um, I didn't think anybody was raise their hands. Well, in, in a sense, I mean, the city's not buying lottery tickets, but there's always this expectation that somehow there's a big solution out there somewhere. Well, there isn't. Real estate taxes are our largest source of revenue that we control. There are other taxes, and everybody knows that. You know, there's a restaurant tax, meals tax, hotel tax. Those are, and they're grants. Those are in relatively small ways, not the answer. So if you want to have um, a real ability to create a progressive means by which revenue can grow, um, you would have a local income tax, an, in, an income-driven form of revenue, as many communities do. Well, that's not going to happen, not in my lifetime um, or most of yours, uh, because, well, we're Virginia. Um, but think about this. Um, when we tie our revenue to just the value of real estate, um, and, you know, I know all the comments about, you know, you keep the rate where it is and you go through that kabuki where you can announce, you know, you're not raising the tax rate, but revenue is growing because the valuation of your home is growing. Yeah, yeah okay, that's, everybody does that. Uh, but it doesn't really solve our longer-term problems. That's why I'm always looking at the constraints on the city and where it can get additional revenue, where it can build that can create strong economic development that doesn't disrupt the community. Um, so one other um, anecdote. Um, if you sort of look at the city population, um, the, uh, the, uh, the parents of school-aged children, um, the, num the number of uh, taxpayers in the city, real estate taxes, do not have school-aged children. Um, uh, they, they may have at one point had them, it's not about private versus public school, it's there simply are fewer children. But the majority of uh, parents of school age children going to school here are not taxpayers. Now, I want to be very careful about that because I don't want anyone to interpret it as being um, somehow uh, a question of who cares. You know, if you're a renter or you live in public housing or uh, housing assistance, you, you can be just as caring about um, the schools as anyone else. But it's a different stakeholder relationship, a big difference in stakeholder relationships. For a lot of you, because I've known a lot of you for a long time, you know, 50 years ago when my kids were uh, starting school here, um, there was a very active parent group. Their kids were in school. They were uh, really aggressive about supporting the schools. And you don't see that as much anymore. Uh, and I, I, I want to, again, because I know people are watching, this is not a criticism of somebody who doesn't happen to own their own home, paying taxes, knowing it's supporting their schools. But it's just a very different stakeholder relationship. And that's not going to change. So, one of the, the things, if I could just jump in on the school there you know one of the things that we don't have in our community here in the state is the school choice and that's a big debate that goes on nationally that you put the money out there and the money falls the child and so um, you know would it work better if or would we be able to save more money and and have more competition if we had school choice here in Virginia 
And if you think about it, I mean, right now, with all the controversial sexual topics and race topics in schools, a lot of people don't want to be in public schools. A lot of people do, but a lot of people have pulled their children out that can afford it. Like our past superintendent and the chair of the current school board have their, had their children in Catholic schools. And my son's in Catholic school, and that's where you stay away from a lot of these controversial topics right now. And I think school choice would be a great idea if that's something that we could, uh, we could do here in, uh, in the area. So Morgan, I have to get back to you on, on this question. Did, I mean, has it ever come up in your conversations with the manager or the council that, boy, we did a good thing maybe in electing school boards by award and letting more people you know, sort of play in that, that pool, but we really should have given them the ability or the, or, the, or the challenge to raise money themselves and not put it all on the council. I mean, would, is this something the city actually thinks about or that they'd like to have the ability to do? And that would require a charter change, obviously. So uh, I don't recall that we've had those discussions formally, at least not in my tenure as budget director. I think there is a common understanding, not within, not in Alexandria alone, but throughout the Commonwealth where you have an independent elected school board um, that but without the ability to um, raise revenue and is dependent on a separate elected body to, to for that revenue that sets it up a, a challenging dynamic um, but I don't know that there's any been any discussion of, about changing the charter and I don't know if that's uh, because that's not favored or because it's doesn't seem a likely outcome in Richmond um, there is one uh, there is one portion of the state law that does allow you to raise taxes, uh, raise the real estate tax for school, school construction, um, but that would still require a city council action, and that, you know, ha that has come up once or twice, but not been approved. Um, so the question I was going to start with a half an hour ago was this, for you starting out. When the budget comes out and someone is a, is a citizen, doesn't know that much about it and they're seeing the first story in the gazette packet or the times or the washington post what's what's the first thing they should look at is it is it is it the tax rate which a lot of people look at the tax rates going up or down is it the debt service or the or the or the debt per capita which i know you guys publish and that seems to be going up every year now i mean what's what's what are the one or two metrics that a citizen should look at to sort of understand exactly where they are in the process so I think um, probably where I would, if I were resident, just looking at the budget as it comes out, um, I would probably look at such things. Of course, I'm probably, as if uh, you're a homeowner, you're probably going to look at what's this mean for my tax bill. But also looking at um, what is the rate of uh, what is the rate of growth in revenues? What is the rate of growth in expenditures? Where is that expenditure occurring? You know, as you mentioned before, a third of the funding goes to schools. Um, we provide the operating funding for all the public safety and human services and recreation agencies, as well as funding the capital improvement program. So looking at not just like uh, what the rate of growth is, but looking at where the expenditures are occurring. And, and we try to uh, communicate that through the budget document in terms of what, what are the drivers behind? What's the need? This year's budget, I mean, what's the rate of growth in the budget from pre last year? Uh, the rate of growth for this year is 5%. Yeah. So that's, that's under the, the rate of inflation. Right. Arguably. And the reason I mentioned that is because I, I dug out from my <clears throat> crowded basement. My wife's going to kill me about this. But um, here's a, obviously a journal headline from October 22nd, 1990, plan ties spending to inflation rate. And this is back when inflation was over 6.5%. Right. And the reason I show that is because at that time, two young members of city council, Kerry Donnelly, who became vice mayor and mayor, and Michael Jackson, who uh, passed away way too soon for my liking, mm -hmm. they proposed a, essentially a rule that would say the city budget should never exceed the rate of inflation. This is a way to control costs because during that same year, I think housing values went up more than 11%. And so people were alarmed about their assessments going up and paying more taxes. And this was a, a reaction by two members of council to say, let's try to control this a little bit if we can. Do you have any kind of built-in in-house guidelines on we're going to stay under the rate of inflation, or does that matter to you, depending on what the needs of spending are? 
Um, we're not necessarily pegging to the rate of inflation, but we're certainly looking at affordability as one of the one of the factors in decision making. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the important elements of the budget process that I don't know if people are aware of is that um, City Council provides guidance to staff in the fall uh, as part of the beginning of the budget process, and often the guidance will take it has in the past taken the form of. Uh, you know, the budget should grow at X percent. That's, that's an example of some guidance that council has given in the past. Or the guidance should, is the guidance that the tax rate should be maintained at a current level or may increase. And often that's driven by, um, we have a retreat with council annually in the fall and November, and we tell them about what we're forecasting in terms of revenues and expenditures, and also what are some of the challenges that we're gonna be facing in the upcoming fiscal year, and that helps them inform what decision, uh, what kind of guidance they want to give to staff. Um, the guidance this past year was that, um, that staff uh, provide two alternatives. One is what would the budget look like at the current tax rate? And the other is that um, what would uh, the budget look like with um, an increase in the tax rate? And the city manager was given the flexibility if he could propose a budget with the tax rate increase and then show the alternative if we cut down to the current tax rate. Um, he chose to present a budget that is at the current tax rate and then provided options in terms, in forms of a recommendation of what he would do if the tax rate was increased. And, um, and I think that part of that was a reflex, uh, reflection on the fact that the, um, uh, the, the you know, affordability is a consideration. And so trying to balance the needs in terms of expenditures, but then the affordability for taxpayers. So I'm going to stay with you again um, because I, I was reminded once again in reading some history on this, um, there was a councilman, a lot of you still know, maybe Lonnie Rich, uh, who served with David. Um, and Lonnie um, had this uh, idea back in the 1990s that the city should probably do less of some things, a lot less, and a lot more of two things in particular, job training and education and let go of a lot of things they do now, or did then, maybe still do today, that could be better served by nonprofits, because his research told him that other jurisdictions, Fairfax, Prince William, Arlington, DC, Montgomery County, did some things through nonprofits that we do here through our tax dollars. Um, he got slapped down um, by interest groups, but he got praised by the local press. Editorials were saying, like, give him a chance to have his ideas talked about. Um, and, but he was still fairly roundly criticized, and, um, and, he, he, and in some ways he withdrew in, this, in the next year or two from proposing such bold, bold action. Um, do you think members of council are encouraged under your leadership to do that? And then I'd like to ask David and Frank in particular, you know, you know is that something members of council should consider, could continue to feel free and, and, and sort of encouraged to do is to say, you know, government doesn't act, have to act one way. There's another way to skin the cat. Um, I remember, I hit, I hit, I'm showing my age here, but Lois Walker, who was on council for several terms, proposed at one point to ameliorate the impact of real estate taxes that David talked about, to increase taxes a little bit across the board on all those other things, recreation taxes, meals taxes, hospitality, just, just to take a little bit of the edge off of the increase and I think she was successful one year in getting council to do that. Um, so I'll leave that question out there open-ended, but when, you, when council tells you in the fall after the retreat to do these things, do you go like, oh yeah, we can do that, or here are problems, we can't do that. I mean, because council members like John are trying to be creative about how to make the budget more efficient. Yeah. Um, so I think the answer to that question is both to some extent, that we do want to, I mean, we want to support the council in the development of the budget, um, but we have a responsibility to highlight for them what are some of the po possible pitfalls, you know, if uh, with a propo particular proposal, um, whether it's legal authority or if it's the if there are implementation challenges or potentially uh, unintended consequences associated with something. That's our responsibility as staff to tell them, you know, for them to set the priorities and say, you know, here's what we want to try to accomplish as a city and as an organization, and here are some ideas on how to do that. And then, of course, they challenge us to come up with ideas, um, but then we are also have the responsibility of when they have ideas to tell them, 
um, what the pros and cons of that are. And you know, we're, if, that's, if, if that's the will of the council and the people, then we're going to do what we can to try to implement it, but we also um, need to make sure that we're helping them do due diligence in all of these decisions. To hear from our three elected officials, did you have opportunities or experiences in trying to say to the school superintendent, Ronnie, or the city manager and the council, let's do this a little different, and if, we, if, if you say no, why can't we do that? things that I was amazed with the, what the budget staff can do, they would have the, the calculator there and they would say after the, all the assessed values out of the property, they say if this is the tax rate, this is how much money is generated and this type. So you can tell, you know, if you raise the penny, here's another $2 million or whatever the number is. But what, what, what a city council can do is come out and say, okay, next year, we're not gonna, your, your tax bill is not going to be higher than it was this year. Or next year, your tax bill is going to go down 2% or whatever. So then they can plug it in and then all of a sudden there's this base number that if we want to keep the citizens tax payment, not rate, payment the same, then this is how much money this is going to generate. Then you're going to see, okay, there's all these more million dollars. Where's our priority? Do we want to keep the tax payment the same? And then you have a hard number that you're kind of able to work off of to determine part of the rest of the budget. So, so just to answer a question of that, I'm sorry, a follow-up question of that. Back in 19, I want to say 1990 maybe, I've got my notes here, um, Mayor Bill Ewell, uh, it was a year when the tax rate was going to be going up quite a bit because of assessments, but he, he persuaded the council and the city manager to reduce the tax rate by 10 cents. Well, so, I think it was 81.5 cents today, it's $1.11, cents, but, but the mayor made a statement, and it was actually cited in an editorial in the Alexandria Times this week where he said, you know, my concern is to make sure that the, that the interests of serving the citizens with programming and education is balanced against what we take out of, not paraphrasing the hides of taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And he, he, and he got the council to pass a 10 cent reduction. So if you look at the real estate market, what happened during those years, we had this huge run up in real estate prices from 02, 03, up until the crash in 08 or 09. And if you bought a property in 09, it might have taken you seven or eight years to get your money back, or if you bought a property in 07, 08. So what happened, all these values went up, and that's why you're able to bring your tax rate down. So the ta I, don't, I think the tax bills probably still went up, and we're, we're, we're in a situation right now where when COVID started, all these property values went up in 20, 21, and 22. And I'm in the mortgage business, and it's been the slowest five months because interest rates have gone from 3% to 6%. And I had a, a couple I was talking with yesterday. They had $900,000 borrowed at 3%. They wanted to downsize, and we're talking about a $600,000 loan. The new payment is going to be more than their $900,000 loan. So guess what? They're not moving. And so this is, this is another huge issue when people go to qualify for homes. People were qualified for 750000 last summer. Now that same income, the borrower is only going to be able to borrow 550000 And so that's going to also affect our home values here. I mean, some of these prices are very high, but we're also going to get a flattening, I think, coming here on the real estate values. So, so Ronnie or David, did you have the experience when the tax rate was being lowered to help taxpayers that you can still deliver essential services and feel good about your position on that feel good about oh, i'm sorry well in other words you're like okay we're, the tax rate's being lowered to x amount i've got we got less money to spend but we're going to find another way to skin that cat and provide the services people want most and did that work out for you we are always having to go back and forth with the budget and reduce things take things away Unfortunately, sometimes it's just a matter of, okay, well, we can't put as much as we want. Maybe we wanted to do the entire high school with this particular thing. Maybe we're going to have to just do the seniors because they're the ones that are going to be out in the real world the soonest. So maybe we can't do all three grades. Maybe we have to dial it back a little and hopefully the next year and we'll do it in stages instead because it'll, it'll use less money. It'll cost less money. So we have to ask for, you know, the council will not have to budget as much for us if we can do things in stages instead of trying to do, like maybe we wanted to do something for the entire high school. We wanted to just do it all at once. And then we're saying, okay, no, we can't do that. So we'll do it for the seniors. And then we're just gonna do it for the juniors and seniors. Or start at the opposite way, start in ninth grade. 
and then the next year do ninth and 10th because those ninth graders are now in the 10th grade. So we have to continue with the program for them, but we want to bring the new kids in so that they can learn instead of trying to do all three grades. That's one of the ways that we would work with that if we get cut. Well, the city fundamentally has four, four requirements to the, to the community. Public safety, public health, public education, and public works. And the fact is, and you can't pretend it isn't, the city cannot do all of the things that people want. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do you, you know, discover a new source of revenue? Um, no. I mean, you can tinker around with some of the smaller ones, but that doesn't really work. Um, so you, you have to find areas that you can either reduce some of the costs um, and still deliver quality service or postpone um, or stage uh, some of these expenses in different ways. Uh, but this is, uh, again, sort of going back to our lives. If we know there are a number of things that we want to do to spend our money on to enjoy the quality of our lives, and we don't have enough money to do it, we either go into debt, uh, which is not necessarily the best way to do it, or, or we begin to say, well, we can't take a vacation this year, or, or whatever. Um, that's the, the smaller version of what the city is always addressing. Interestingly enough, the emergence of some of the larger nonprofits have begun to pick up some of the responsibilities that uh, a community, government would typically be doing, um, particularly in areas, for example, of early childhood education, um, housing, assisting people that are uh, struggling either with COVID or during COVID or a lot of other areas that they can't, simply can't afford. And I know this goes back a few years. I'm not even sure, Ronnie, you were on the school board, but um, we used to have a work session council and school board. Um, and one of the reasons that I was uh, strongly opposed to elected school boards, um, although I knew why it was getting support, was that the school board was then uh, sort of kicked the can by saying these are the things we want and putting on city council to have to find the money as opposed to a school board says these are the things we want and we have to find the revenue for it. So one of the things that um, you were talking about, Kerry and, and Mike Jackson, one of the other things they did in the 88 to 91 council was they introduced a rule. You, you heard uh, Rod talking about uh, add delete, which is sort of the final thing that happens when the school, uh, the budget is being adopted. And it was, um, you know, there's something that members of council were opposed to, that's a delete. Members were in favor and you could get enough people convinced to support you. But there was, um, to be kind, a lot of grandstanding that went on at that final couple of days because you could put in, you could propose any ad you wanted and then even if there was no support, you could go back to whatever the interest group was and said, well, you know, I tried. So they introduced a rule that said, you cannot propose an ad unless there was a corresponding delete or a, a, a new source of revenue. Now, council's changed it a little bit, but I think it's a good change, which is sort of the same rule about the, you know, find the revenue, but it requires three members to agree to that. I think I have that right three members to agree to the ad and identifying the source of revenue or a delete. And I think that's put some control over, um, you know, throwing stuff out just because it curried political favor. Uh, and so with the schools, one of the um, drivers for their budget requests is enrollment. And enrollment projections are really hard. Um, and I remember one year we were going through this and school, I, I don't know if you were on it, you'll remember when I finished this story, um, that um, they came in with a fairly large request because they were projecting a significant larger enrollment. And as it turned out, 
a lot of that enrollment, that extra enrollment didn't materialize. So I endeared myself to the school board by saying, well, if you want more money because there's more enrollment, shouldn't you give money back to us because you didn't like have them? Yeah. yeah, and so that, I didn't make any friends off that, but, um, but the, the argument was more kids, more money. Um, and as a general rule, it's probably a pretty good argument. Keep class size low. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, on the, when you're on the council, you know, a lot more people come to you asking for things than people showing up at City Hall saying, hey, my tax bill's really high. So as a city council person, you know, you need to reach out to your city council people, let them know how you're feeling. I mean, you, this, is, this is how you can do it at local government. But I mean, we would go to the public budget hearings and everybody, give, 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 but not a lot of people are saying my tax bill is too high. But actually something I'm seeing in the community right now is I've, I've seen more editorials and more um, trepidation about these upcoming tax bills than I have in the past. And um, you know, another thing is there is no maximum tax rate a local municipality can set in Virginia. So the highest tax state is New Jersey. The average New Jerseyan pays 2% of their house value. Illinois second at 1.9. So we're at a dollar, about a dollar eleven. But keep in mind, if you have four city council members that want to increase the spending, there really is no no maximum on this tax rate. And I'm just really worried that you know we could be sitting here four years from now and be paying twelve or thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars the average homeowner on a tax bill. So we got to control. Yeah. Um, Frank, to be fair, I mean, I re I recall a uh, an election back in uh, probably the mid two thousands where two members of city council did lose their seats uh, because the, that, that year the issue was the tax rate and one of them was the current mayor, Justin Wilson. Um, and, and there were new people put on and then they, they came back, or they, you too, yeah. <laughs> but not because of the taxes. Um, so I understand that. I, Morgan keeps looking at me like Morgan wants to weigh in here and you probably, no you don't, you do? Um, That's okay, I got another. No, there wasn't anything. I got another question for you. Yeah, sure, not. go ahead. Well this question, we've had a number of questions does the city have a rainy day fund? I believe it does. Yes. But, but, but how did that come to be? And if the city has sort of a, an excess of money in the bank, essentially, why are some of these issues so cantankerous? I mean, in other words, could one year the, the fund be used, someone asked to, to lower the tax rate a penny? Or is there some sort of rule that governs that you have to use as budget director to govern how that rainy day fund gets used? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, we do have maintain a fund balance. It's accumulated over time uh, through budget surpluses. Um, it's important. Uh, I think it's it's in the low twenty percent right now. But um, in, 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 in round numbers, in terms of millions, I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, I well, twenty percent of a budget of eight hundred eighty million dollars. That'd be one hundred sixty million dollars. Yeah. Okay. okay. So. Um, so, but so we have uh, requirements that um, that we need to maintain a certain level of fund balance in order to, uh, you know, just as you say, as a rainy day fund. Um, it's important that we are able to demonstrate to the um, bond rating agencies when we're issuing public debt that we are a carefully managed uh, financial organization, and they look to. Uh, they look at that as one of the indicators. Uh, the other important thing is that. Um, well, let me let me just ask you a question here, Morgan. So you mentioned the bond rate agencies. I used to work for Standard and Poor's, probably the preeminent bond rate agency, and and the reason why they they are most likely to give any jurisdiction a AAA bond rating is because that jurisdiction has a wherewithal financially and politically to raise taxes when needed to meet obligations. Right. It has nothing really to do about management so much of, the, of their city or the county. It has the ability to raise revenue to pay bondholders. So if that's, if, if the city's got $160 million in the bank and Councilman Chapman decides he wants to go bold and say, let's lower the tax rate three cents, that would be 15, 60 million bucks at 160 million. I mean, is that, would that be a, could you say to him, I can live with that, we can make it work? Or in other words, how is that, is that fund, which a lot of people point to as an important resource for the city that can be used to meet, if not just tax reduction, but maybe more special ed or more firefighters. I mean, but but how, explain so, to people how yeah, that rainy day so, fund really functions. Right, so the challenge with that is that those are one-time funds that have been accumulated over time. 
And if what you're looking to do is to use that as funding to support a, um, an increase in services or a reduction in the tax rate to fund services that are going to be continuing in perpetuity, um, then you're using a one-time source to fund an ongoing need and that, you know, that, that source eventually goes away. So that's one of the challenges with trying to do something like use the fund balance to reduce the tax rate. Okay. So think of um, this. this. Again, back to your own lives. Um, what if you have to dip into your savings to pay your bills? Because you can't get that back. So if you start uh, financing your life in different ways by dipping into savings every time you run into a jam, um, guess what? At some point, you won't have a savings anymore. One of the factors in the bond rating is the, the so-called rainy day fund. I mean, it's, it's not just one thing. They look at that because they know that communities often run into unanticipated expenses uh, of different sorts. COVID being a particularly good example recently, but it's not new. So keeping a savings account, which you, know, you can argue is sort of like um, the rainy day fund, um, and identifying where it needs to be used um, is an important part of the fiduciary responsibilities of the city council and the city manager. And um, you can't just pave it over. Um, you know, or papered over, I mean, um, well, paving too. Um, but it's one of the things that um, people look at. I don't think, unless it's, something's different now, uh, talking about the tax rate, this, the city posts notice of the budget and the rate, and it also gives, I think, it, didn't they post a penny as the maximum increase? Yes. Okay, so they can't do a whole lot, uh, and Penny's not insignificant um, with the size of the real estate base, but um, um, it still puts some cap on the rate, uh, I, and I have no idea whether that's going to happen, but it can't suddenly go up. Can it go down? Yeah. At a time when the city's revenue is already strained in so many different ways, it may, it may make good politics. I don't know if it makes good finance, financial management. So Morgan, there's a question here that might be best addressed to you. Thank you, David. Um, I mean, David talked about the four public needs, education, infrastructure, public works, public, works, public, public health. Public health. But there are other things the city does. And this, this sure. question here says, how do you prioritize elements that are not necessary, like those four, um, that are obviously important today in terms of public policy awareness, things like broadband connectivity, privacy, Freedom of Information Act access and transparency to city records, um, making sure that kids in school who don't have um, the kind of connectivity they need to, to conduct their, their education at the same level as people who do. I mean, those things are kind of soft and they're not part of the four legs of government, I would say, that David described. How do, how, do you, how do you try to work through those when you know they're important to members of council and the mayor and, and the city manager and not to mention citizens? I mean, where do you, where do you, where do you, how do you score that in your budget? Um, so uh, some of those things I think you probably can make connections to uh, some of those four areas or those four priority areas like broadband is an opportunity for, uh, you know, for education. So. There are ways in which some of those things that may not feel as directly connected to actually have some connections. Um, council, uh, you know, this current city council set a set of priorities uh, at the beginning of their term back in January of uh, a couple years ago. And that, so that's been the guidance for, that's been the, what we have formed the budget around over the past couple of years. So when we send our instructions out to departments every year, we are telling them that um, when you're preparing your proposals for the upcoming year, we want you to be informed by this set of priorities. And you know, some things will be very directly connected with those. Some things might be a little bit more uh, indirectly connected, but we are looking at those connections as part of the um, 
decision making process because it is you know budget is I think what you all are all saying uh, in in different ways is that is budget is a series of trade offs it's you know it's we do not have the resources to do everything that we want to be able that all constituents want to be able to do um, we do have a finite uh, amount of resources and we do need to uh, be concerned and mindful of the affordability of taxpayers to pay for those things. So it is a process of making trade-offs, and so we have to weigh uh, so the benefits of those various proposals against their costs, and, and we use the council priorities as a sort of a guidepost. Well, for that. well here's a follow-up question for you. There are several that ask why it's so hard for the city to say no to something. So are there any examples in your tenure as budget director or certainly members of elected, elected officials where you would just someone come to you and say like, no, not this year, we just can't do that. I mean, flat out, we have other things that are more important. I mean, is that part of your job? When's the last time you do that? I, I would say most of the PMOs, probably most of the departments within the city and a lot of constituents would say that, or constituencies would say that, that we've had to say no to something that they wanted. Um, I'd say that's pretty. Uh, that's just inherent in the budget process, uh, in the sense that, that you know we we have to make these trade-offs, and we cannot afford to do everything. And so that you know, not everybody is going to be completely satisfied with what they get through the process. But um, I think you're absolutely correct in the. It's. I think this is why the public hearings and the and the public input uh, process is so important, is because there are competing interests and competing needs and and for people to make their voices heard and be vocal that's you know that's that's what we need to to understand what the desires of the community are well thanks i've got a question about that in a minute but first let me ask the three elected former elected officials how do you how, how hard is it i mean obviously i'm sure it's easier for you to say yes to somebody sure i'd like to support that but how did you handle the yeah, not the not this year thing. What's Bill Cleveland? No offense, we were, Bill, you're really good at that, Bill. Yeah, <laughs> not this year. Uh, Frank, I mean, it's just like when you tell your kid no, he'll be mad for a second, but then he accepts it. So I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you you just yeah, you just have to you have to draw the line and uh, you know try and you know say maybe we could w work it in in next year. But um, yeah, you just. I agree. I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned earlier, though, when we were talking about the rainy day fund yeah. and you mentioned special education. Yeah. Well, one of the things the schools does that they do try to raise some of their own money for things. We do have grant writers and they write grants and we we get we actually supply staff with that. We may have right now we're looking at mental health because that is a big issue right now. Children committing suicide. Just just the whole COVID thing. It has really affected children even so i don't want to say more than adults but they're not used to not having any social life and now all of a sudden they're all thrown back together and there was another shooting today in kentucky i don't know if everybody heard about that but i mean or tennessee nashville yeah and 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 three children three nine-year-olds and three adults and it's just horrendous and we have to we have to have mental health people in the schools to talk to these kids when they need it that's a priority um I don't know if the schools right now are looking at metal detectors. I mean, we found somebody in the school with a gun. I mean, I mean, do we want to protect our kids? Of course we do. School school in both people say we don't want to have detectors. metal detectors. Some people think that's the yeah. wrong image. No, they're coming. But is it? Will it save lives? I mean, these are all things that you have to have up for discussion. But as far as grants are concerned, it may supply um, a staff member for a position for a year, two years. But then when that grant money is gone, and you know that it's working, it's effective. You need to put that in the budget and you need to have that person stay. You don't want to lose them and then you're going back, right back where you were before. So there are issues like that and it's not for a rainy day fund, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying, but there are times where even staff members, that we are doing our best as a school system to try to find ways to pay for certain positions and programs and we have partners. We have Virginia Tech is a partner that has done incredible things teaching our kids. I mean, there's, there's so many programs that people aren't even aware of that are going on in the schools right now. But we still need the help from the city council. And it really, I mean, one of the things that the school board does is they had liaisons, and I think they're still doing that, uh, where the school board members are assigned to a different council member. 
I had John before, and I had Frank. Frank asked a lot of really, really, really tough questions on me, I'll tell you. But it was great, because he was learning, and I was learning what the questions were. And I think that needs to continue, because there's a lot of people that are new on the council that I don't know how much they know about the schools. Honestly, they may have all visited the schools, I don't know, but this is important, because they need to see what's going on in the schools as well. Well, we, before, thank you, Ryan. Before I ask my last question, David, I want you to address this as well, but I also want you to address it, if you can, from the standpoint of, because this is something, once again, your former Mayor Donnelly spoke of. I remember him distinctly saying, sometimes the schools will get a grant to do something that's really good. We'd love to have them do this, and the grant will be for two years or three years, but then the grant goes away. And then the school board comes to the city council and says, well, we have to keep doing this because it worked. And the council's got to say, well, um, where's the money coming from? So, David, what was your experience with having, a, if you had to sometimes, a difficult situation, say no to somebody? We can't do this anymore. Um, well, uh, you know, we we're, were, were a political body. You can't pretend you aren't. And when you were, at least in, in terms of how I would try to approach it, if I knew that uh, it was there was some strong feeling about it, most important thing for me, I can't speak for anyone else, was that if I was making a decision that was contrary to what someone wanted, it was important that they knew why I made that decision and that it wasn't given sort of passing thought. Um, so it, I didn't want anyone to walk out of there saying I, I made a decision out of whim. But the truth is that with counsel, I mean, there are a lot of smaller decisions, and somebody may not like one of them, but bigger decisions often involved having to tell someone no. Um, consequential decisions. When you're making appointments to boards and commissions, somebody's going to be told no, um, and you, you always want to feel like you're being honest and forthright uh, in the decisions that you make. And so somebody may walk out of there and say, you know, what, he was such a dumbass, but um, but at least I knew how he arrived at that dumbass conclusion. And um, oh, this is being recorded, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> whoops. Um, but I did. Uh, um, yeah, but David, this is like who's the idiot who did that thing? I, I wanted to add one other thing though about um, <laughs> sort of the the um, the disconnect that we often deal with all of us here everybody involved in making these decisions. And that is the relationship between assessment and appraisal. Everybody wants a high appraisal, looks good on your net worth statement, and everybody wants a low assessment. Now there's a process by which you can appeal an assessment, but at least as far as I can remember, and you can correct me or anyone else, I don't ever remember someone coming before council and saying, I really think you assessed my property too high. Um, I mean, somebody felt that way. There's a, there's a system you go through. You don't need to come to council. But nobody ever complained that they had a higher assessment. They complained about their taxes, even if the rate stayed the same. And um, this is why so many decisions right now that the council is looking at, where commercial buildings are being repurposed as residential, where housing is being built in, in different places that you wouldn't, some infill. But again, you know, you look around the city, there are only so many places that you can build before you create uh, a, uh, either intended or unintended consequence. Too much density um, or too many drains on the city's uh, revenue because it's more families with kids in school and all kinds of things. And this is, this is why the thing that I worry about the most, I've said it twice now, is the constraints on our sources of revenue. Not next year, you know, we'll, we'll, the kabuki dance will go on, uh, but 20 years from now when um, some of you may not be here, uh, and that's, you know, we're gonna see that, and it's scary to know that we don't have the resources that we think we will need as we go forward. Thank you, David. Um, we are past our lot of time we normally spend for these, these programs tonight, but it's been such a good discussion. And I, I, I thank your indulgence as panelists and, and audience, both here and online. 
I just want to ask one last question, maybe with a quick answer. And in some ways, some of you have touched on this. I mean, if, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, what, what advice would you have for me as a citizen to have an influence on the budget, program funding, tax rates? I mean, how do, how do you want to be approached? Do you want to be approached by email? Do you want to buy a cup of coffee? Uh, do you, I, mean, I mean, do you want to come them just to come to a public hearing and state their case? And in that regard, Morgan, if you could start out, explain what the schedule is for public input, because some of our questions ask that very question, like, okay, when's my opportunity to go to the city council? Okay. Um, so there are a variety of opportunities to do that. Um, the first is that we do collect, we start collecting input from the public um, early in the process. I mentioned we do a city council retreat in November. Uh, at, at that point, we start collecting input on the budget process. From that point forward, anybody who wants to provide uh, comments or questions can do so. Um, public hearings, we have, uh, there have been a couple, uh, so far, um, we are required to have one by state law every year. Um, we're actually having three uh, this year, and one of the, two of them have occurred, and um, the one remaining, uh, public hearing is on the ad delete process, which was mentioned earlier. This is also an, a new component of that, which is, by the way, a, a great process and one that's not in use in a lot of jurisdictions um, that requires a, 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 a certain amount of discipline on the, on the on behalf of the uh, city council, which I think is very important and, like I said, not done in a lot of places. But um, there is now also a public hearing. so. Um, on April 6th, the city council, current city council members will uh, submit their proposals for ad delete. And as was mentioned before, they have to be co-sponsored by two other members um, and they have to have a, a corresponding revenue source or offsetting reduction. And uh, those will be uh, delivered to us on this by the 6th. Uh, we will publish those on the 7th and then on the following uh, Saturday at the regular uh, City Council public hearing date, there will be a public hearing on those items. So that'll be the next opportunity to provide input into. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, Frank, what's your advice to people who want to I mean, if the you, budget? Uh, talk to your City Council members. I mean, we're just so lucky here in Alexandria that they're accessible. Um, you know, we have one, one here tonight. I'm going to be on a phone call with another one tomorrow morning. So reach out to your City Council members. And, you know, one of the interesting things about Alexandria, this is a really an international city right now. I mean, we have 25% of the people who live or were born outside the United States that live in Alexandria. And, you know, we still have our city council members that we can talk to. You're not going to be able to talk to the governor tomorrow or the president, but you can talk to your city council members, and they have the biggest effect on your, your local life. So uh, reach out to them. They're all very helpful, even though you might not agree with them all the time, but they're helpful. Thank you, Frank. Ronnie, what's your, <laughs> Ronnie, what's your, what's your advice? Do you have any? I, I would say I would just mimic the same thing. Um, if it's concerning the schools, talk to your school board members, but also talk to your, to your city council members because they need to hear the issues of the schools as well. And lastly, David, what would you tell people here and online and else, anywhere else in the city if they want to have an influence on a member of the city council or the mayor or the staff like Morgan? How do they approach that? Public is hearings just work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, lots of people come. When you come before the, uh, the council and public hearing, there is no requirement in the charter that you have to be broad-minded and thoughtful and, uh, you know, pushing for your own cause. You know, you have a right to come and speak. But the public hearings on the budget, all, uh, not all the time, but would produce a point of view, a case, that really need to be considered that we hadn't thought of. And I'll give the example because some of you know her. Pam Walkup, who used to be the uh, head of the uh, Education Association in Alexandria, I told her every time she came to the public hearing, she brought something up that we hadn't thought about. And um, I, I had, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not watching the hearings anymore. Um, and um, uh, so I don't know, there may be another Pam Walkup but they, it helps if you come in and not just you know, pitch your own personal grievance, but talk about something that's important and why and how, you get people to listen. Well, on that note, I just wanna thank this panel. Give them a round of applause here if you're at home and you're still awake, clap for them as well. This has been a wonderful session, I think. I appreciate each of you spending the time 
not just to be here, but to prepare for this beforehand. Um, and I, I hope that the audience got a lot out of this. This will be available, of course, on stream. If you had, didn't, if, if your friends or neighbors couldn't have seen it tonight, tell them they go to the website of Virginia Alexander. They can, they can at their leisure, pick it up and take a look at it. Um, I notice we still have snacks and wine in the uh, in the room here. So those of you who um, are streaming, you're out of luck. But those of you that are here, if you want to stay and mingle, talk to the panelists, talk to each other. We have some refreshments. Yes. Tell, tell them who you are. Uh, I'm Charles Wilson. I served uh, nearly 10 years. Yes, the school board. And I'd like to say, uh, please, uh, the school board does not need to get the authority to raise taxes because it will result in complete chaos because of the differences between District C and District A. Uh, just ask Arlington why they regret ever having that capability to uh, explain. That's a, that's a good point. Thank you, Charles. Second, one thing. As far as this city, uh, there's a risk to our budget that's very significant if we don't watch out. And that is Fairfax County will really try get us to participate in TJ. And no. uh, TJ, uh, remember Ronnie and I were one of the- That's the Thomas Jefferson Magnus School that's now very controversial. Ronnie well, that, but, well that's, that's probably a topic for another, another forum for us. I was going to say, Ronnie and I defeated that motion to uh, spend lots of money right. for Alexander taxpayers. Okay. But it's coming up again, so beware Thank you, Charles. We'll keep this in mind for a program from next year, maybe. But anyway, once again, thank you very much all for being here. Appreciate it. This is Agenda Alexandria, a nonpartisan organization that takes a look at the issues without taking sides. Whether it's the city's sewer system, education, public safety, climate change, or perhaps a look back into Alexandria's history, Agenda Alexandria is here to shine a light. What makes the organization so successful is our people. The people who run it, our panelists, our moderators, and of course, our members. Agenda Alexandria is a member-funded organization, and we invite you to become one today by visiting agendaalexandria.org. <laughs>